Hi, my name is Andy Bullock and I'm the Executive Director of Mount Kearsage India Museum here in Warner, New Hampshire. And we thought we'd give you just a sneak peek of our Northeast Woodlands Gallery as you're confined at home and, and thinking about all the exciting things that you're missing here at the museum. So this is still a bit of an experiment for us, but we're thrilled that you could join us. And our founders, Bud and Nancy Thompson, had originally laid this museum out so that around each corner of the museum galleries you'd see new surprises and new things unfold. So I think that this little visit is going to be a tribute to their vision for what this museum could be. So thank you very much for joining us and I hope that you enjoy the next brief visit to the Northeast Woodlands here in New England. So the Northeast Woodlands Gallery is the largest one here in the museum in Warner, New Hampshire. And we're just going to do a brief walkthrough here to explain when folks come to the museum. One of the main things we talk about with school groups and things like that in all of our galleries are kind of what the important things are for how folks would live traditionally here and in New England fishing and things like that are critically important to survival and the importance of building fish weirs and things like that. If you look at the mural down below, that's actually a diorama of a weir that was built in Manchester at the Amiskeg Falls. And then also in the gallery we have some wonderful artifacts, some Iroquois corn husk dolls and dance bustles and Gustoe uh, men's headdresses. And then we oftentimes talk about the importance of lacrosse, lacrosse being a native game that would oftentimes include hundreds or thousands of people and played over mile long courses and was certainly a, an important way to settle differences among groups and instill camaraderie. I'm going to pan out a little bit here and we do have a couple of wonderful outfits from the Northeast here. A Iroquois woman's outfit made with cotton and wool and lots of glass beads, Italian glass beads, and you'll notice a Glengarry bonnet on her head. Certainly a tribute to some of the influences of the Scottish and the military here in the Northeast. And just one example of a uh, Ojibwe man's outfit. You'll notice the wonderfully beaded leggings and apron and certainly showing the floral influences of a lot of that art from around the late 1800s and early 1900s. And here in the Northeast we also talk about the importance of birch bark and how so many things could and continue to be made from birch bark here. We've got a wonderful log carrier in the lower left corner made by Toma Joseph who's quite a renowned artist from here in Maine. And I'm just panning around a little bit to show you some other birch bark containers and also another wonderful Ojibwe floral beaded outfit. Lots of these containers uh, made from birch bark and you're looking and, and you'll notice that they're brown rather than white and for the most part these containers are made putting the white part of the birch bark on the inside and these designs on the containers are not usually painted but are etched or scratched into that inner bark of the um, birch bark. In each of the galleries one of the important things we want to remind folks is that Native people are still doing beautiful traditional art. And in each gallery we have a little snippet that shows some of the wonderful contemporary newly made art made in these traditional styles. And so we have some wonderful artists represented here and I'm going to um, miss a few so pardon my shortcomings with names but we've got a wonderful bag by Rhonda Besaw. Uh, Jim Taylor is represented, 
Liz Charlebois has done some wonderful work here. And so it's just our way of acknowledging and appreciating how these people continue to support these traditional arts. And then I think that we have a wonderful collection of Northeastern baskets. And these baskets, for the most part, are made with black or brown ash. And here in the foreground, you see a log that has been pounded so the ash logs would be laid out, pounded with a maul or the back of an axe until these annual rings of the um, log peel up. And then those are used for the splints to construct these baskets. So it's a very traditional thing. And then that also opens up conversations that we can have in the museum here about the fact that emerald ash borer beetles are really decimating the ash here in the Northeast and it's really having an impact on our native artists. Lots of our galleries are actually oriented so that the older parts of our collection are on your left. And here you see some wonderful colored splint baskets from the Northeast from 1850 to 1900 and long before the invention of Tupperware totes and things like that these baskets were an important part of the economy here in the Northeast and often were made by native folk throughout the winter and then sold uh, through fairs and, and through vendors in the spring in order to support their family. We've got a wonderful collection and I'm sure this video won't do it justice, but the absolute wonderful art artistry that goes into making these baskets, and we have wonderful baskets that are made mostly using the black or brown ash splints and oftentimes decorated with sweet grass in order to give it a, a wonderful aroma. And even after many, many years, these baskets still can retain that wonderful aroma of sweetgrass, which is a very important medicine to native folks. And as we come around to the right, we've got some more contemporary baskets made by native folks. And a couple of those newer ones right in the middle, you'll notice, are made by a, a new friend of the museum, Barbara Francis, who's a Penobscot basket maker from Maine and she is very involved with the museum in helping us to develop a um, contemporary gallery exhibit where she's going to actually be able to share her vast knowledge on how these baskets are made and she's going to be our contemporary art gallery artist in residence as soon as we can get that organized with this new reality here. And I'm just going to pan by again to show people the importance of native art and, and the fact that it's still being made. We've got some wonderful hands-on exhibits that talk about the different kawas, the twists that go into these baskets, and how also some pictures of how these materials are secured. Again, some more contemporary artwork showing some of the dyes and some of the different netting techniques that are made for art here in the Northeast. So we appreciate that you're coming here today to spend some time with us. And we're always looking for creative ways to engage with you because we appreciate the important part of our visitors as our community here. And here in the Northeast, if I can get these lights to come on here, there we are. Sometimes you get what you ask for. This is an example of one of the few uh, Assumption sashes. These are uh, woven by, oftentimes by the nuns of the Assumption, or they were taught um, to native folk to make these beautifully handmade finger woven sashes that are just phenomenal and the, the weave in them is so detailed it's just like a woven cloth.
thank you folks for joining us here. It's always nice to see the, the wonderful comments. And I know that Sue, for instance, is asking about Barbara's basket class. And we certainly look forward to that. Barbara is a wonderful resource for the museum here. And those of you who have had a chance to meet her at Pow Wow, for instance, know that she's just a wonderfully gracious and lovely person. So we appreciate that. So we're still in the Northeast Gallery here, and we've got, I think, a stunning collection of early porcupine quill decorated boxes, for instance. And most of these boxes are made from birch bark. The containers are made from birch bark. And then it sounds quite simple, where they'll just take an awl, for instance, and poke a couple of holes and put each end of the porcupine quill into a hole in order to lay those in place. And, and that certainly sounds like a very simple process until you look at the elaborate designs and color combinations and things like that. So many of these boxes, especially again on the top left, are some of the early ones from probably 1840 to 1850. A lot of these things were made for the tourist market where again native folk were able to use their traditional arts and skills in order to support themselves um, because so many of our traditional ways had become unavailable to us but uh, that economy was very important and, and continues to be and you see that with these wonderful artists who set up at powwows for instance who spend all winter long creating their beautiful work and it's an important part of their economy but also it's a way to share their traditions as far as the importance of native art in their lives. And this exhibit here, I'm going to just stop for one second, is an example of moose hair embroidery and a lot of folks when and if they see it at museums, because it's quite unusual, a lot of people assume that it's either silk thread embroidery or maybe porcupine quills. But these are actually articles that are made using the moose mane, like under the neck of the moose, where the hair is the longest. And these skills were actually oftentimes taught by the nuns and residential school supervisors as a way to encourage, we'll say, native people to adopt more European skills. And so there's certainly a, a dark side to that conversation because we know that residential schools and things like that have had a devastating effect on native people even to this day. But the artistic part of it is just wonderful where they've incorporated those skills to become um, native art forms all of their own. So these, you'll see some moccasin tops up at the tops, and then in the foreground there are some birch bark containers that could serve as cigar holders or card cases or eyeglass cases or something like that. And still in the, the northeast, and you'll see let me try and get up in close here. Lots and lots of beadwork here, which many of you are, are very familiar with. And we've got some wonderful bead artists I know who are looking in at our video here, so we appreciate your joining us. And these three bags on the top right are called bandolier bags, oftentimes called bandolier bags, and are carryovers of hunting bags and, and also military shot pouches and things like that. And it just shows kind of how this native art mentality is to make everything beautiful and and to reflect their native natural environments. And these bags, again, started out very, very utilitarian, but as you see, have become quite decorative and were often worn and continue to be worn in ceremonies and powwows and things like that. And you see the one straight ahead here, it's got a little bit of a pouch, so it's kind of a practical piece that can uh, store some basic materials. But what happened over time 
these were so important for prestige and, and honor, so someone would spend all winter long making a bandolier bag for a loved one. That was just prestige and honor. And here's a piece that was actually part of our artifact adoption, and we were lucky enough to have a great friend, Katie and Scott, to adopt this piece. But you'll notice that we call it a bandolier bag. It still doesn't even have a pouch, so it, it has no official or mechanical purpose other than to display all of this wonderful talent in beadwork, but it doesn't even have a pouch attached to it anymore, so it just shows the evolution of some of these art forms. I could talk about beadwork all day, but you would be bored to tears. And we talked a little bit about, I'm going to have a hard time showing you this here in this um, method today. This is actually a moose hair embroidered tablecloth, altar cloth. We're not exactly sure of, of what it was originally, but it's about eight feet long and five feet wide. It's made on dark blue wool. And all of those floral decorations, the center floral, and then all of those elements that go around the edges are actually moose hair embroidery. So it's quite a, a stunning piece and one of only a very few that I'm familiar with. So we feel that that's a real important part to our museum collection. And then we're going to go and take a quick look at some of the beadwork from here in the northeast and see how that's going to work. So in the top you see a, a couple of beaded hats. In the center is uh, oftentimes called a pumpkin bonnet. It's like a round hat. And then on the left a Glengarry bonnet and beaded moccasins. And then I'm going to try and get closer on these pouches on the bottom shelf. And my poor job on this video will just encourage you to come and see for yourself as soon as you can because these beaded articles are absolutely stunning. So a lot of these beaded pieces called whimsies oftentimes were made again by native folk as a way to support themselves. So these were sold at state fairs and at Niagara Falls and things like that through the years um, as a real important way to have these families support themselves in using native traditional arts. I'm gonna pan out a little bit here and on the bottom shelf. Wonderful beaded vests. And again some more beaded bags from the northeast here, uh, including Iroquois and Abenaki and several other groups. There we are. So I'd like to thank you very much for joining us in Mount Kearsage India Museum's Northeast Woodlands Gallery. I encourage you to visit our website and Keep an update on when we're opening to the public and the events that we do have coming up. We certainly appreciate your support. Thank you very much. Have a great day.